Welcome to our service of morning prayer on this Palm Sunday, April 5th, 2020. Today, we have three people with us. I'm Reverend Beth Hewson, the officiant. Reverend Derek Neal is with us, and he is the reader. And Reverend Linda White will be our preacher. If you have a candle, you may take time now to light that. Today, we're not using palms, per se. We're all encouraged to venture into our own yards where green things are beginning to reemerge, filled with the promise that new life is waiting through the winter for its appointed time to burst forth. Cut whatever greenery is available to you from a tree or hedge or even a few blades of new grass, if that is what is available to you. These branches, not imported palms, will be processed this year, only as far as our front door and then back again, as a gesture of care for ourselves and for our neighbors following the way Jesus as this current crisis asks of us. And this is my palm, and part of an evergreen tree. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Christ became obedient unto death. O come, let us worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God. And a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. And the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, his, his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee. And kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Christ became obedient unto death. Oh, come, let us worship. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Dear friends in Christ, during Lent we have been preparing for the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery. On this day, our Lord Jesus Christ entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph. The people welcomed him with palms and shouts of praise, but the path before him led to self-giving, suffering, and death. Today we greet him as our king, although we know his crown is thorns and his thorn a cross. We follow him this week from the glory of the palms to the glory of the resurrection by the way of the dark road of suffering and death. Unite with him in his suffering on the cross. May we share his resurrection and new light. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, 
Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy into the celebration of those mighty acts whereby you give us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 118, verses 1 to 2 and 19 to 29, responsively. Give thanks to the Lord who is good. The mercy of the Lord endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim, the mercy of the Lord endures forever. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. Those who are righteous may enter. I will give thanks to the Lord who answered me and has become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, Lord, Hosanna. Lord, send us now success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord and has shined upon us. Form a procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will thank you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord who is good. The mercy of the Lord endures forever. Glory, Glory to, the to the Father, Father and to the Son, and, Son and, to the and to the Holy Spirit. Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them. And immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophets, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very, very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in a turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Hebrews acclaimed Jesus as Messiah and King with palm branches in their hands, crying, Hosanna in the highest. May we also, carrying these emblems, 
go forth to meet Christ and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you this morning. We ask that your word may be our rule, that your spirit may be our teacher, and that your glory lived out in our lives may be of first importance to us. So we ask that you would speak to us, for we pray in your name. Amen. Well, recently I had a chat with someone who'd been thinking about the difference between optimism and hope. According to a Wikipedia definition, optimism thinks the best thing possible will happen and hopes for it, even if it's not likely. It wants to set a day or time when things will get better. It's the kind of answer so many people are looking for these days when they ask a politician or a medical officer, when will COVID-19 be over and everything back to normal? By Easter? By the beginning of May? By the summer? While optimism can be a positive quality, it can also lead us into frustration, discouragement, and eventually despair when the optimistic predictions we press out of our political leaders, the medical experts, or financial advisors don't happen in the timely way they predict. Hope is a different thing than optimism, particularly when we talk of Christian hope. Christian hope can be defined as the confident expectation that the future is unfolding under the care and providence of God, no matter what our current circumstances are or what the future might bring. Biblical hope grows out of our faith in God and our hope feeds faith as well. The great biblical example of someone who lived with this kind of hope was Abraham who, um, as we heard in our Old Testament reading for the second Sunday of Lent, was promised by God that God would give him a land and make of him a great nation through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. Abraham certainly didn't live to see the fulfillment of this promise in his own lifetime, but his steadfast faith and the hope that it continued to foster in him was reckoned to him, we read, as righteousness. Hope, then, is expectant waiting, confident in the word of God and of his mercy and grace and peace available to us, even in tough times. Well, this morning, we join the crowd outside Jerusalem. The hillsides of the city serve as a large temporary campground for the gathered pilgrims, many of whom have traveled from Galilee to be in Jerusalem for the Feast of Unleavened Bread and then the Passover. Now those gathered from Galilee have seen much of Jesus. They've heard his teaching there. They've seen him challenge the religious elite. They've seen his healings. They've, they've been fed with bread in the wilderness. And they've lived in almost daily expectation that he would declare himself king, raise an army, and defeat the hated Roman overlords. And full of optimism, They've been ready to answer the call. They're all in agreement that with Jesus of Nazareth as their leader, they'd show the Romans a thing or two. The whole campground is a buzz with expectation of what will happen when Jesus shows up. Our attention turns now to the top of the Mount of Olives, where Jesus is mounting a borrowed donkey, one apparently that had never been ridden before and thus especially suited for sacred purposes. A simple word that the master needed it had been enough to satisfy its owner. Clearly, this is no momentary impulse on Jesus' part, but something prepared beforehand. So let's pause here for a moment because I think two things become evident in Jesus' action. First of all, the calm courage of Jesus. He had to have known that hostility awaited him in Jerusalem on the part of the religious leaders. 
However enthusiastic the Galilee crowd might be about him, the authorities hated him and had sworn to get rid of him. In such a situation, prudence would have dictated that he slip quietly into the city and keep to the back streets. Instead, he acts with calm courage and a trust in the fulfillment of God's plan. William Barclay in his commentary writes, Jesus entered Jerusalem in a way that deliberately set himself in the center of the stage and riveted every eye upon him. All through his last days, there is in his every action a kind of magnificent and sublime defiance. And here he begins the last act with a flinging down the gauntlet, a deliberate challenge to the authority to do their worst. So we see as Jesus climbs on the donkey, calm courage in the face of hostile authorities. Jesus also knows the expectations of the crowds though. As N.T. Wright reflects, they wanted a prophet to call down God's judgment on their enemies. But this prophet would clear the money changers from the temple and tell them that they all were under God's judgment. They wanted a Messiah, but this one was going to be enthroned on a pagan cross. Even though Jesus knew he would be, not be meeting their expectations, that their current adulation of him would turn to fury in a moment, he was not deterred, but faced the day and the events to come set in motion by his ride down the mount with calm courage, steady faith, and hope-filled trust in God. Well, not only do we see that calm courage, but we also see the clear claim of Jesus. For so long, Jesus had not allowed his disciples to say who he was, and he'd often cautioned those that he healed not to tell, not, not to talk about him. But now on Palm Sunday, everything changed. Jesus knew by heart, as did everyone in the crowd, the words of the prophet Zechariah, as he foretold the arrival of the messianic kingdom. Behold, your king is coming to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey. He will cut off the chariot and the war horse, break the battle bow and command peace to the nations. He will restore the kingdom of David from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Jesus set about purposely to fulfill that prophecy, to make the clear claim of who he was, God's Messiah, despite the consequences that would come. Well, it's no wonder that the Galilee crowd went wild, full of optimism that the freedom of the nation was as good as done. They spread their cloaks and waved palm branches, just as they would for a victorious king and his army, returning home from battle, laden down with booty for all to share. And they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. You know, for years, I thought that Hosanna was just another praise word, like hallelujah. But it's not. Hallelujah is indeed an exclamation of praise. But the literal meaning of the word Hosanna in Hebrew is save now. In fact, the only other place in the whole of Scripture, Old and New Testament, that the word Hosanna is found, other than in the Palm Sunday accounts, is in our psalm for this morning, Psalm 118, where we read in verse 25. Hosanna, Lord, Hosanna, Lord, send us now success. And that's what the crowd is shouting to this Davidic Messiah. Here comes the Savior, save us, Lord, send us success now. And I think the emphasis is on now. None of us like it much when our optimistic predictions are dashed. The Passover pilgrims were no different. As the week went on and Jesus did not come through with a political revolution, the tide began to turn against him. When their optimism died, their shouts turned, as we know, from save us now to crucify him. From our post-Easter perspective, we now see and understand that Jesus was actually answering their Palm Sunday cries. 
It was indeed Jesus' purpose, purpose and intent to save his people, not from political oppression, but from something much deeper and more important. He came to save them and us from our sin to pay the cost to restore our relationship with God. And so the road ahead led to self-giving, suffering, and death, his crown made of thorns and his throne a cross. The road ahead led to the abandonment of not only the cheering crowd, but his closest friends as well. And added to the spiritual anguish, added to that, the spiritual anguish of separation from the Father that the bearing of the sin of the world would entail. But steadfast in faith and in hope, he rode that donkey right into Jerusalem. In light of all this, it seems to me that one of the hallmarks of us as Christians these days should be hope. Christian hope that is so much more than wishful optimism. Hope is a deep and confident expectation that we will get through the tough times with the help of the Lord. It doesn't mean what we might say if we were to say, I hope I don't get the virus as we pop our lucky rabbit's foot into our pocket on the way to the grocery store. It's not the kind of boastful hope that says, oh, I'm a Christian and I've prayed, so it doesn't really matter what I do. God won't let me get the virus. That is foolish optimism. Christian hope is quite different. It's something that ironically can only be grown in us as we go through times of struggle. And there's no question that the global pandemic and all its social, community, business, and investment challenges, not to mention the many who are in a life and death battle with the illness, is indeed just that kind of time. This is the time that offers to us the opportunity to grow in our own personal Christian hope in a way and to a depth that isn't possible in more ordinary times. Do you remember what Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans that we heard a couple of weeks ago in the epistle reading? He encourages the, hurt, the church to rejoice in the hope of sharing in the glory of God. Not only that, he writes, but we boast in our sufferings knowing that tribulation produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and that hope does not disappoint us because god's love has been poured into our hearts by the holy spirit who has been given to us we are surely in a time of tribulations and difficulties and we do not know when it will end but we can be confident that in the midst of this, as the Holy Spirit is ministering to us the peace and love of God, we are becoming more and more, well, as N.T. Wright recently reflected, small shrines where the presence and healing love of God can dwell. This is a time when we can expect our Christian character will grow and deepen, helping us to be steadfast in hope that out of this will emerge, and here's N.T. Wright again, out of this will emerge new possibilities, new acts of kindness, new scientific understanding, new hope. May we be confident, may we be steadfast in prayer, in love, in service, and in commitment as the Lord is with us through this time. I close now with the benediction of Paul found in Romans 15, 13. Now may the, God of, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us say to you the affirmation of our faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. 
This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbors as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for all those who are alone. For this community, our country, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Anne, our Archbishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in the world for our own needs and those of others. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all those who have died in the peace of Christ, and for those whose faith is known to you alone, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. The call it for Palm Sunday. Holy and immortal God, as we enter into this holy week, turn our hearts to Jerusalem, so that united with Christ and all the faithful, we may enter the city not made with hands, your promised realm of justice and peace, eternal from age to age. Amen. Amen. Gathering our prayers now together and praises into one, let us pray as our Savior has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.